Husbands, I don't know if you've ever done this before. But sometimes our wives worry a lot. They worry about various things, different things, and sometimes they can come to you with a really big problem. And I'm going to tell you today something that does not work. When you say, honey, just calm down. Okay, that never works. Or the other one is, don't worry about it. That also doesn't work very well. So guys, just giving you a little bit of a tip here today. Over our 15 years of marriage, I've learned not to say, calm down, and not to say, don't worry about it. But at the same time, we're going to be looking at something that Jesus says and telling us not to worry. Doesn't that just kind of make you anxious when Jesus says, don't be anxious? <laughs> and you're sitting there going, but wait, I am anxious. So now I'm anxious about being anxious, and Jesus told me not to be anxious. Even Paul will come later on, you know, don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. And, and in those, those moments, you go wonder, you just start to wonder, well, is Jesus upset at me because I'm worrying so much? Because he tells me not to worry, but here I am, worrying. Let's open our Bibles. Let's see what Jesus has to say in regards to what it is in our life that we worry about so much. And they could be many things, but we're going to look at what Jesus has to say. Open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 6. As we continue in the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus is talking about stuff. Now last week, we, we talked about stuff in the sense that Jesus says, don't store up treasures on earth. Somebody at Potluck last week, they asked me, they said, what was the sermon about? I said, don't store up your treasures in heaven. I got it flipped up. <laughs> you know? No, you want, you want to store up treasures in heaven, not store up treasures on, on earth, as Jesus said. And now it seems that Jesus is going from one extreme to another, right? He's going from, don't store up all this stuff on earth because it's going to rust and it's going to rot and it's going to get stolen and all these different things. But now we're switching over to this other side of, of people that are listening to what Jesus has to say. And I don't know about you, but when Jesus says, don't be anxious about your life, the first thing, I go, well, the first thing that comes to mind is, yeah, thanks Jesus, thanks for that. It's kind of like telling someone to calm down. It's kind of like telling somebody to say, don't worry about it. When something in our heart makes us concerned, what do we do about it? What do we do about it? Let's pray. Father, as we open up your word here this morning, I pray that you would speak to us. That these would not just be words on a page. They wouldn't just be history. But God, that they would come to life and they would transform our hearts. I pray that you would anoint my lips and my mind that the words that I speak are from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Do not be anxious about your life. The word for life there is, is where we get the word psyche. This idea of your, the, the total embodiment of who you are. Everything that you own, everything that you have, every, every gift that you've been given, everywhere that you go, your job, everything, Jesus says, holistically, do not be anxious about your life. So how many of you are following the command of Jesus and not anxious about anything in your life? Not one thing. None of us. So it's pretty good that we're studying this today so that, so that Jesus can speak into our heart. He says, do not be anxious about your life. And now he's giving some, some descriptions, some things that they particularly would really understand well. He says, what you will eat or what you will drink. We've talked about this before, but I think it's, it's worth noting and remembering that they didn't have Walmarts and grocery stores, okay? They had markets that only sold what was harvested around them. And so if a storm came through, if drought came through, if fire came through, if an enemy came through, everything that they have stored up, everything that they have, every morsel of food could be wiped out in an instant. 
There were some who spent every single day just scrapping and scrapping just to get enough food for the family. Because if they didn't, the last meal would have been their last. Water. Think about how blessed we are to go to a faucet and just turn it and clean, fresh water comes out. I mean, have you ever just thanked God in that moment where you're like, I don't have to worry whether or not this water is going to make me sick. And yet, in their day, you can imagine that any amount of anything would pollute. And, and the thing is, is, is things would get into the river. And when I say things, you know what I mean. The things that we are so blessed to have plumbing for. Those types of things get into the water system. Those things that are around them, you could smell it. Hygiene was not one of those things that, that was really kept up in the city. So there's troughs along the, the roads of just disgusting stuff. Sometimes they didn't want to deal with a, with a body, and so they just would toss it out back. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you and I just would not even be able to comprehend because here's the thing, is when we see that Jesus is saying, don't worry about what you're going to eat and drink, the majority of us, not all of us, but the majority, majority of us could go to a pantry and open it up and find something. Find something. It may not be what you want. <laughs> you may have to cook it up and make, it out of, make something out of it, but you could find something how many times do you go to the pantry? I mean, just think about it. How many times do you go to the fridge or you go to the pantry and you open it up and you just sit and you look? And you look around and you see what you've got and you look at it and you go, I don't know, I'm not feeling that. You go over here, I'm not feeling that either. That's too much work. And so you close the doors, you go, honey, you want to go out to eat? There is, I mean, that's the world that we live in. So for Jesus to say, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink, for us, we say, well, that's not really a big concern that I have. I've got other concerns. Look at what else Jesus talks about. He says, do not worry about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Every one of you has clothes on today. Thank you for that, by the way. That's a good practice to have. But I would imagine that the majority of us, all of us, could go to our closet and open it up and look and say, well, that doesn't go with that, so I don't want to wear that today. I mean, I, I have so many ties that when one I found that had this big stain on it, I don't even know what happened. This morning, I went back to my closet and I had to sit there and look of all the ties that I've collected over the years. You know, Father's Day is good for, you know, for ties. So, you know, all these ties. And then my dad decided he'd donate a ton, ton of ties too. So I got all these ties that, that I've got. Please don't buy me a tie. Thank you. Just have to say it. There was a pastor for pastor appreciation. He got eight ties. So thank you, Kay, for not getting me a tie. <laughs> But, but that's, that's the world that we live in. You, even though you may not say, well, I don't, I don't have a tie. I don't have, but you got shirts, you got t-shirts, you got shorts, you got something. You open it up and you get to decide every day. Maybe you only have a little bit. Maybe you've got a whole big closet. I don't know. But the majority of us, when we read this, it doesn't hit the way that it would have hit them. You see, what's interesting about this, even though Jesus is saying, isn't life more than food and about what you are, and more about clo and, and clothing, he's talking in their context to them. But here's what I've noticed. Most of us have food and most of us have clothes. And most of our worries don't come from what we lack. Most of our worries come from what we have. Think about that. The things that we have. Because many of us worry that we're going to lose the things that we own. It's why you worry about the bills. Because you have electricity and you don't want to lose electricity. You have running water and we don't want to lose running water. We have a roof over our heads and we don't want to lose the roof of our heads. You see, most of the worries or concerns that we have 
are in regards to losing the things that we already have while they were worried about things that they didn't have. Do you see it? How it's totally flipped upside down for us today in this context in the West. Not everybody has the things that you and I have. Isn't that kind of what Thanksgiving time is about? To stop and ponder and thank God for the things that we do have, but also to help those who need it as well? He goes on for, for some descriptions here. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they now birds do work right I mean they go and they make nests and they do all the things God doesn't put the food in their beak right but he provides everything that they need in other words the birds don't worry they just they go out looking for twigs and they bring them back and they go out and looking for other things that's going to bind up their nests and they go out and look for food and they bring it back to their young they do all these things and they just know that it's going to be there and so that, I think that's what Jesus is trying to say here is not so much that you just sit, the birds are sitting back and God is putting you know, food in their mouth. He was saying that, that every need that they ever could imagine, they've got. And they're a bird. And birds are beautiful. I don't want to, don't, don't disregard. But uh, birds are birds. They're not humans. They're not made in the image of God. You see, he, he created us to be in his image. He is, we are very special to him. Birds are special to him too. But in, when, in the world of creation, we would say that we are the crown of creation, not the pinnacle of creation, the crown of creation. Because he's created us in his likeness and he, he brings us together even on Sabbath. That's what that last day, the pinnacle of creation was a Sabbath day which sparked this relationship between him and us. So understanding that, that these are birds and yet God still takes care of them and so Jesus even says, are you not more value than they because you are made in his image? He continues, and which of you being anxious, I love this, which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? In other words, it does no good to worry. It does no good to be anxious. Now understand something. The word anxious here can be translated in different ways, but one of the ways that it can be translated other than anxious is concern. And, and here's the thing, is, is there's nothing wrong with being concerned sometimes, right? Now, concern is different than anxious. Concern is this idea that, that I'm concerned for my brother or my sister, and I need to help them, right? I'm concerned about the situation, and so I'm going to, I'm going to step in and try to help in this situation. Concern is one of those things that puts upon your heart to say, I'm going to step out in faith and try to help this person. But anxiety, anxiousness, is this idea that I see someone helping and all I'm going to do is worry about it and I'm not going to do anything about it. And also in our life, when there's something that we cannot control. And what is one thing that you can't control? The future is one. And yet, what do we worry about the most? What's going to happen tomorrow? And so as Jesus is bringing this out, he says, which one of you, by being anxious, which one of you, by worrying yourself, can add a single hour to your life? In other words, it does no good. In fact, research, science, the medical community has proven that worry is bad for your health. So it actually shortens your life and doesn't expand your life. He continues on, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 
But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. The lilies of the field. Whatever, whatever flowers, so there's a lot of, you know, scholars debate what kind of flowers it was. I don't think that it, we have to focus so much on what flower it is. I think we look at what Jesus is saying. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. I like this because it doesn't say, consider the lilies of the field, how beautiful they are. Consider the lilies of the field and, and what, what they add. Now, he goes on to say that even Solomon wasn't arrayed like this, so he talks about the beauty, but he says, consider the lilies and how they what? How they grow. And it says how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. They don't have to work hard to grow. Why? Why? Because that's what they're created to do. See, at this point, point in what Jesus is talking about I think there's a little bit of a shift I think that there's not just talking about the physical realm I think Jesus is starting to get into some of the spiritual things as well and maybe it's 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 dual right that he's talking about the physical he's talking about food and he's talking about clothes he's talking about those those needs but then he shifts and he starts adding this other dimension because we're going to see it as in the next verse that we're going to read. But, but in this, what, what is it? Consider how they grow. And could it be that Jesus is also talking to us in how we grow spiritually? And what is it that we neither toil nor spin? In other words, we grow because that's how God created us. He created us to grow. It's kind of like the, the fruit of the Spirit, right? I mean, we grow fruit of the Spirit. Like, that's part of it. It's, it's when we are filled with the Spirit and we are f- in Christ, then there should be a transformation that takes place in our hearts and in our lives, right? And so the fruit or the work that comes from all of that is a natural byproduct of, of the spirit you've heard me talk about this a million times i always bring it back that an orange tree doesn't have to try hard to grow oranges the orange tree just does it because that's what it was created to do if you and i are filled with the spirit of god then we should be transformed and all of a sudden love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness self-control should be natural byproducts And I shouldn't have to be going around trying to prove to people that I'm a good Christian. I should just be one because that's what God is creating me to be. Do you see it? So consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither neither toil nor spin. Consider how we should grow. That it's not one of those things that we have to constantly really try hard. You know what we really need to do? Surrender. Is put it in God's hands. Stop trying to take matters into our own hands. Because when we're worried and we're anxious, whether it's about the things in our life or whether it's about our our spiritual condition, oftentimes what will happen is we'll take matters into our hands and we're going to mess it all up instead of trusting God with it, surrendering it to him. Because Jesus just said, your God knows what you need already. Why would he create you and, and create the needs that you have and then not give it to you. And that's what Jesus is trying to come across. That's what he's bringing together is this idea that everything we need, we have in our creator. He's giving us everything we need. And you might be thinking to yourself like, but pastor, there's been times in my life and there's people in my life that I see that, that are Christian, that, 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 that love God, and yet they're, they're really, really, really struggling. We're going to encounter struggles. We're going to encounter bad times. You have gone through really dark moments in your life, and you may be in one right now. You're never alone. 
God is always with you. I've gone through really dark times in my life, and I know that I will go through them again. And I have to remind myself in this, do not be anxious about the future. Know that God has everything in his hands, in his control, and I can trust him. Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. When we are in Christ and we receive his righteousness, we should be growing. There's a transformation that happens. See, there's, and I think that maybe we get confused about this, the righteousness of Christ and how this works because sometimes we think that, well, I'm, I get justified, and I'm going to start using some terms that maybe you're familiar with and maybe you're not, but maybe you've heard the idea of justification, sanctification, and glorification. There's like this thing that we use to talk about. Uh, it's very confusing, so let me just put it this way. There's a part where you're saved, and there's a part where God transforms us, and there's a part when Jesus comes again and we're totally renewed. Okay, So in this justification, this idea of, of righteousness, I want to just talk about this for a moment because I think it's really important. There's a difference between imparted righteousness and imputed righteousness. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, Imparted means that Jesus grants us his righteousness immediately. So when we not just profess, we're not just talking about professing. I don't know where professing came from, but that, it's not really... That's not what the Bible says. It talks about believing, receiving, accepting, okay? But the idea of, of, of when we receive Jesus into our life, when we receive the salvation that he has given to us so freely, the gift of salvation, immediately we are imparted his righteousness. We are justified. We are cleansed from all of our sins. Are you with me? Okay. I want to make sure that I'm not, we're not leaving anybody behind, Okay. So in that justification, you and I are cleansed because of what Jesus did on the cross. It's what he did, not what we do. It's what he did, okay? When we are in Christ, now there's a journey. There's this transformation journey that takes place. And that's what we call this sanctification, okay? And, that, that, and, and here's the thing is the Bible talks about that it's, it's both just like you're saved, you continue to be saved, but this idea that when you are sanctified, you're sanctified, meaning that you are set apart for something holy, but you're also being transformed into what God is leading you to, right? You're saved. Now let's move into this journey together. That is imputed righteousness, okay? So think of it this way. I really wish that I had a washer up on stage here today, but can you imagine that we, I've got this washer? You know washer and dryers? Okay, okay, a washer, and I've got this dirty rag, okay? And the dirty rag is us, and we're filthy. We got oil stains, and we got tar stains, and we got food stains, and all the different things, all the decisions and all the things in the sinful world that we have done, and we are this cloth, this rag, and we've tried to get ourselves clean, and we just can't. And we realize that we are dirty. We realize that there's a better way, and that there's a way to be clean. And we, we see the washer, Jesus. And we accept and receive to go in to the washer. And so, Jesus takes us and throws the dirty rag into the washer, I don't know if it's a front loader or if it's a top loader. I, I don't think it really matters in this scenario, okay? So whether it's this way or whether it's that way, and you close the lid, you are now in Christ. Clean, justified, at least from the outside perspective, right? When God sees you, he sees that you are in Christ and you have been put on the robe of righteousness, are you with me? That would be imparted righteousness. Now some of us, as the cycle begins, <laughs> some of us need the cold wash, some of us need the hot wash, 
Some of us need to be washed like 8,000 times in this process. But you are in Christ. And while you are in Christ, there are going to be times that you nail it. And you're going to be so proud of yourself. Because the temptation is going to come, and you're going to say, get thee behind me, Satan, right? And you walk away, and you're thinking, yeah, I just proved that I'm a Christian. And that's beautiful to celebrate those times, but really understand that it's really not you that's giving you the strength to even say no, right? You have surrendered that to God and let him do that in your life. And you know what? There's going to be times where you don't nail it. There's going to be times that you're in that process and the temptation comes and one day you were strong and the next day you weren't. But you realize immediately uh, that's not, I don't want to live that way. And there's this conviction and there's this move and, and you, you confess that Jesus, you're my Savior, you're my Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness in my life. Guess what? The entire time you're still in the washer. You're being renewed and refreshed. That's what we call imputed righteousness. In other words, while you are in Christ, even when you mess up, that's why we have the mediator. That's why we have what we, our doctrine of the sanctuary of Jesus in the most holy place, imputing his righteousness on every single one of us today. And in Christ, you are blameless. In Christ, you are holy. In Christ, you are righteous. Outside of Christ, and here's the thing, is you may reject it and you may say, I don't want anything to do with this anymore. Guess what? Pull it out and guess what you are? A dirty old rag. Still dirty. But I believe that you'd have, to, you'd have consciously made the decision to reject salvation. You don't want anything to do with Jesus. But even still, the washer is right there and the Spirit of God continues to draw us by his love. And there may be a time in your life that even though you walked away like that prodigal son, you may have walked away like that lost sheep. Guess what? It's still a son and it's still his sheep. And he goes after it. Goes after that sheep. Go find it. Bring it home. Sometimes we get to a point in our life where we realize, I would rather be back there. That's the Spirit drawing you back by his love. And God is there waiting. He says, get over here, grabs that rag, throws it back in there. You are now in Christ. And you have just experienced imparted and imputed righteousness. Come on. This, this is what we believe as Seventh-day Adventists when it comes to salvation, when it comes to sanctification, when it comes to the life journey of growing in Christ. Go read your fundamental beliefs in growing in Christ. Go read Steps to Christ, you're going to find that this is what we believe. In fact, there's a book called Christ Our Righteousness that was written by A.G. Daniels, but he was very close, very, very close to Ellen White. They wrote together. They did things together. They were were working on various books together when she died. And, and he goes through to, to, to review certain things that she wrote in regard to righteousness. And this is one of the things that he, he wrote that she wrote, okay? Righteousness by faith in all its meaning is comprehended in the following definition. The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. I got them mixed up. I'm so sorry. Imparted, imputed. You could see how I could get them mixed up. (laughs) The first is our title to heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. So now I've got to change it in my mind here. Click, okay? So when we are justified by Jesus, we are imputed the righteousness. And when we are going on this journey to heaven, we are imparted his righteousness. 
She continues, imputed righteousness by which man is justified from guilt is the foundation upon which imparted righteousness is bestowed. It's what Jesus did on the cross that he can keep doing for us today which sanctifies the life conduct and provides our fitness for heaven. It provides our fitness for heaven. His righteousness does. As to the operation of these living principles, we quote as follows, Christ has become our sacrifice and our surety. He has become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Through faith in his name, he imputes unto us his righteousness and it becomes a living principle in our life. Jesus gives us his righteousness and his righteousness transforms us. There's nothing wrong with looking in the mirror. There's nothing wrong with self-reflection and asking yourself the question, am I I living the way that Jesus wants me to live? And there's, there's other things you can ask For the Spirit, Spirit, show me in my life where I need to grow in my walk with you. That takes a lot of humility. It takes takes something that, that, you know, recognizing that you're not hitting the mark all the time, but even in those questions, it doesn't mean you're outside the washer. It just means that you're on a wash cycle and that God is continuing to move in your life. The question is, is where is your heart trajectory? Is your heart trajectory towards Jesus and his kingdom? Or is it in your selfishness and the world? And, and you may, it may be one of those things where you're trying to, to do both. Well, Jesus just got done saying, there is no neutrality. You're either in or you're out. But your trajectory, when you're in, doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you're sinless, but you can't let that be an excuse to keep doing the things that we want to do. We allow Jesus to transform us. So the Spirit's probably going to convict you. The Spirit's probably going to show you things, but he's always going to show it in hope and in love because in the gospel, it will always point us to Jesus as our Savior and as our friend. So, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Surrender to Jesus and let him do the work in your life. And you should receive transformation. This next part, of uh, it's actually in Desire of Ages. It says, no repentance is genuine that does not work reformation. What does that mean? It means that you don't have to go around and fake it. True repentance and accepting Jesus Christ is going to naturally grow you into what he has called you to be. That's the process. Let him do what he does best. So he says, if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. By the way, it's not talking about hell, okay? They literally would gather grass for fuel kind of like what, when you burn wood things like that they would use that to burn in the oven and basically what Jesus is saying is the lifespan of a lily and the lifespan of the grass is so little but even in that God says look how beautiful they are look what they do they serve a purpose they point us to him you, you know guys maybe we don't do this some of us do But sometimes you're on a hike, sometimes you're on a walk, and you see these flowers, and you just can't help but stop and look and admire. And what does that do? That points us back to our creator who created these things. And if God can create that and work in that, then he can do everything in your life. And so this is what Jesus says, the cure for all worry. Are you ready? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You see, that's why I said it's going spiritual. Because it's not just the physical world, but Jesus is saying, seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added to you. These things, what is he talking about? The, the, the necessities, the needs. He doesn't say all things, <laughs> but the things that we need. And what does that mean? Why, why is that? What, what's... 
why do you think Jesus is saying this? And then in, in verse 34, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You and I know that last line to be true. <laughs> Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Some days are tough. Some weeks are tough. Some months are tough. Some years have been tough, haven't they? I think what it comes down to is this. Oftentimes, we are worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. We're worried about the future. Right? What about my kids? What about my spouse? What about my job? What about this? What about that? And there's going to be difficult times that hit. There just will be. You've been through them and we will be, be through them. But here's the thing. If we trust God, if we trust him, whatever is to come, we know that he is with us and that he can turn anything around that he works all things for good to those who love him according to his promise he works all things for good I know sometimes that verse is thrown at somebody that's going through a really tough time and in the moment you go I don't want that right now <laughs> it doesn't feel like he's working things around for good but always when we keep the faith when we look back, we can see what? We can see that God was there. And if we trust God now, we trust him and we keep focused on his kingdom, the kingdom that he ushered in, and we seek first that kingdom, and we seek his righteousness that he gives to us, imparted, imputed, whatever that word you want to do, he gives it to us. And in that, guess what? You're going to make it. You may not make it on this earth, but you're going to make it in the next. We may not have all, everything work out for us right here, but there will be a day. There will be a day when Jesus breaks through the clouds to come and to take us home. And when he comes to take us home, there will be no more death. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more tears. All the, the former things are passed away. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Do no business, do no thing, do no anything that's going to distract you from the main thing, the thing that Jesus has called us into, his kingdom. His kingdom. And in that, he says that he will take care of everything. One day at a time. Live one day at a time. Don't worry about tomorrow. The past is gone. You have today. Let's live today to the fullest when it comes to seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seeking him with all of your heart. Going and living a life that brings him glory. Going and living a life and, and all the work that you do that other people see and give him glory. Everything that we do, everything that we say, everywhere that we go, may we be the salt and the light that Jesus has called us. He says, he says that your righteousness must exceed the scribes and the Pharisees. And whose righteousness did he say? He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he gives that to us, he clothes that with us, but he also calls us to live a different life for him. Listen to his spirit. Just trust. Can I leave you with that today? Just trust. You have today with our Savior. You have today with your God. You have today to make a difference in other people's lives. You have today. Don't put it off to tomorrow. Don't say I've got time. We do it today because today is all we've got. And so we live today to the fullness of God. Everything we do, what does the Bible say? Everything we eat, everything we drink, everything we do, we do so to the glory of God. 
everything we have today. Just trust. I know. You think, but if I do this for God today, then what about what happens tomorrow? And what about just trust? Today is all you have. You and I are not guaranteed tomorrow. Next week, as we gather together, we may have less. Somebody may go. Somebody may pass. Live today. Just trust. Just trust. Just trust. Father in heaven, forgive us when we have not trusted you. Forgive us when we have taken matters into our own hands. Forgive us, Father, where we have we've made things about us and not about you. But Lord, in this today, we are so grateful that we can trust you with everything. You know what we need. You created us. So you know every single aspect of our life. You know what we need. So Lord, by the power of your spirit, would you help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness today? That we would live today for you. And that the thoughts that we have and the words that we speak and the actions that we do, Lord, that it would be for your glory and your honor today. And Lord, if tomorrow comes for us, may we live that day trusting you in that day. Help us, Father, to just trust, to trust you with every area of our life, our kids, our parents, school, our job, our work, our friends, our witnessing, our church, our finances, the food, the clothes, everything. May we learn to not be anxious about anything, to pray about everything, and just trust. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.